Thank you so much for being here today. Um, so before we get started, I want to manage expectation. Um, we are going to talk about learning in exponential times, but it's not going to be that exponential. Like there's no track, like there's no transhumanism involved. We're not going to talk about, you know, how to get some brain implant either. But instead, we're going to talk about how we can design community-based learning systems. So before I jump in, I'm Margot Pelen. I am a freelancer. I'm an educator. And I help people with big ideas in education turn them into prototypes and then into full systems. So that, that can mean launching for university and sometimes university departments. That can mean launching courses or sometimes for corporate universities. I was born in Paris, uh, but now I live in Berlin, and I will have a couple of examples and projects to share with you today. So I'm, I've been working in education for the past six years now, and before I went on this like journey towards this, uh, I actually physically went on the road because I was super interested to understand how, because we now live in this like global internet, um, and we tend to think that there, we have to scale. We have to go from Silicon Valley to the rest of the world or from China to the rest of the world. But there is another form of super inspiring education, um, innovation, which is a low-tech version. So I went to 10 different countries and I looked into M-Pesa, which is like this SMS system, which can also be replicated towards education. I also went to um, Medellin. And I realize that you do not see what I see, so I have to. Yes. No, it's not working. OK, whatever. I can see the slide and I can walk you through them. So I went to, um, I went to Medellin to kind of understand how libraries could have a huge impact on people's life with super small and yet very efficient systems. And ironically, I ended up being in Silicon Valley as I got a full scholarship to go to NASA. So through all these different steps, I had hypotheses, you know, ed tech, education, technology, that's so important for a lot of people. And a story after the next, I realized that everything had impact, like at that those innovation had impact on philosophy, on social, on basically it was everything in between education and technology, and that really made me think. So when I came back to France, I thought, well, I actually want to work in education full time, but because those um, innovations are so local, I want to focus on adult education as it's the one that's more uh, globalized today. So I came back with main questions, which were at which scale can we drive change in this adult education, and how can we adapt our systems to help workers stay as relevant in the future? which is also, as you hear, not only education. Um, so let's take a few steps back, you know, like, what's the deal? Like, why am I talking about this today on this stage, focusing only on tech normally? Um, if you take a few components, so first point, two point, like, first point that absolutely key, content access is growing exponentially today. Yet content delivery is mostly the same. If you take, for example, YouTube, in 2009, there was 20 hours uploaded per minute. Only nine years after, you have 400. You cannot possibly keep up with this. And I'm not only talking about cats online, I'm talking about sometimes real content, uh, because YouTube is today arguably like the most important platform for free online education. And in the same time, like, okay, ooh, another button. Cool. Uh, and in the same time, we still train people like they're getting ready to work in factories. You know, the system that were designed 150 years ago still have the same look and feel. You know, it's the same people teaching the same content in the same style. And it's also, to be fair, it also sucks for professors because they have so much to teach and share with students beyond this like standardized content. Second dimension. 45% uh, of tasks are likely to be automated, which means that many roles or jobs are, of course, being created. And I think we are like, building this in this room. But it also means that a lot of those roles are evolving. If you look at marketing, for example, we went from madman to a crazy team of multi-people who have to bring all their skills to understand how you go to predictive marketing or content creation and different support. It's not the same job. 
Third factor to understand, like the classical patterns are just no, no longer valid. If I look at my father, for example, he's still working in the first companies that he got hired by 35 years ago. And to his an understanding, I've been probably changing five times what I'm doing. As a consequence, learning is a new gym. You have to keep on retraining. And this is something very important, not only for economical purposes, but you have to keep this agility of learning. So it's a gym, like, you know, you don't go once a year or like once for the rest of your time, but you have to make sure that 20% of your time is dedicated to learning some new things so you can also grow in your role. Where it gets a bit complicated is that it's not only about going to school and then being sorted, even though you go on a more regular basis. Education is kind of failing also. In the States, you have a debt of $1.5 trillion, which is even bigger than the subprimes 10 years ago. You have a lot of people who pay for degrees that do not grant them a job anymore. So you have a negative return on investment on certain trainings, a certain education system that they do, and they struggle to get into jobs that they wish they could be hired for. In the parallel, like in the parallel world, you have 45% of the same American people who are doing at least you know, one free gig on the side. But we're not only talking about people who, um, who are like underskilled. We're not talking about Uber drivers who do this on the side because they can't, they can't sustain their family. You have a booming number of people who are extremely skilled. For example, 12% of those very high-paid freelancers. So we're talking about nearly 2 million people in 2009. And today, that's 20 for like 21%. So we add 1 million to this. So those who actually could get hired are actually not that into it anymore. If you summarize it, so that's like the, this is if everything was working well. And you actually have this situation instead. You have those who want to be hired, who don't actually interest companies that much, but companies who would like to, add, to, to hire some people are not really getting this reciprocity. If you have to summarize it to a dating situation, you basically really want to date someone who really want to date your friend who's not really into it anymore. So how do we move on with that? So a couple of solutions based on concrete cases that I, that I was involved in. First things, we all convinced here that API is also a way to get into that. So new tools can actually be invented for this. Some APIs can help us track real time how the market is changing, but also where are the, like, where are the opportunities. For example, a few years ago, I actually developed a tool with a couple of friends in the States, and we used the API from Angelist to get an idea of the market. What it meant is that, because you know, when you go on Angelist and you post um, an offer, you actually detail what you expect in terms of skills, which means that you get one, like all the data together, but also when you dive in specifically, you get also how the role is changing. For example, growth hacking, it's fairly new, I would say like 10 years, but the role itself has been changing. So here, the first, like what we call primary skill set is basically what you expected to be doing in this role, which is good enough if you look at it now, but how does that evolve? And for this, we also developed this monthly trend that helps you track what skills are becoming more important for your role to make sure that you actually still a fit. The question is, after a, year, after a year or two, could you actually still apply for your job and get in? The second solution that we can consider and that we have to really think about is how can we redefine the higher education deal? Because as we know today, companies actually struggle to keep these people, like people that they see as super talented who maybe don't want to be hired anymore and want to go freelance instead. And as a consequence, companies are becoming campuses. And I think we should really go into this direction where they know that they have a responsibility to help their, their team members grow within the company. Uh, what you see in the back is not an entertainment park, that's a new campus of Facebook. And I can tell you, it's actually built by the same people today. The other dynamic that we see is uh, new education signals, because it's not only about bachelor and 
master and PhD, like the Bologna system we have in Europe, it's also shorter loops. If you look at Udacity, for example, with their nano degree program, they're basically rewriting the economy, like part of this really <laughs> speedy economy, focusing on the right partnerships, which are like the big companies, which also gives an amazing edge for these companies because they have access to what we call learning analytics, and they can see real time wherever they are, they are lear like learners who outperform the others. And last but not least for this point, we need also educators to bring in more real-life cases for students to actually know what work is going to be like. So, for example, I was proud to be involved in the launch of Code University in Berlin. And the deal is simple. Day one, whether you're studying product management, software engineering, or interaction design, you're working with people from other crafts. So you learn those collaborative skills, and you also work on your projects, but also projects from companies who come and support the university. So it's obviously a win-win situation, because they get to train and work with the students, but they also get to send people from their team for them to also have an understanding on what, what are the trends, like on what the trends are. So on the left, that would be code students working on project, and on the right, it's the end of a, one of the first um, one of the first corporate projects that we did. So 10 companies from year one, knowing that so year one was last year because it opened in October with 90 students. And this year, 150 new students showed up and decided to come. Um, and that's also the same. We have like an increasing number of companies, but also nonprofits and other kind of organizations who want to come and you know, share cases. Another kind of solution, learn from the past. So this guy that you see were probably the first like tech bros. Um, they happened to be the first drapers, which were basically like you know individuals who decided to come together to be able to take on bigger projects, but who would also accept that well you know you get started in jobs, so you actually you actually need to learn from older people, which means modern guilds, collective for freelancers. And I know that guilds is also has a connotation in in tech companies because it's how you like use in a, it's how you navigate in very agile environment. But here I'm really talking about guilds for people who are going to be studying new, you know, new craft, and then who need to learn with the community. So it means also taking apprentice, then becoming a master after time, but also accepting that you will also be training people. And I know of a project, for example, in Berlin now that wants to train a lot of data scientists, and they want to have the system in which they can actually train more people to kind of bridge the skill gap that we saw earlier. Another like extension of this, a physical extension, factory in Berlin, which is now a two-space uh, co-working, um, which is home, I mean, work home to uh, 2.6 thousand people, also mixing with corporates but who also have a very, very active community on Slack. 130 channels, including 50 that have at least 50 members. It's a way to really retrain and to keep on you know, embracing what's in terms of novelty and what's in terms of who to follow and who to learn from. And because it's both a physical place in which you can just mingle with people, but also extend it online, you, you really get a lot of options to stay in this um, update. OK. So if we go back to this, how, how does that sum up? Like we saw three kind of different trainings. So we can really limit the risk. We can have for those people who don't want to be hired. It's really important to consider those exclusive trainings that are going to be like focusing on new collectives with this influence on development. Also internal trainings, because you want to keep your best people and you want to make sure that, well, those who need to really need, those who need, sorry, um, to have this, you know, build up and skill up will be supported in that, but you also need to make sure that the people who really add a lot of tech value, for example, are going to be supported and are not going to be tempted too much to go out. And even if they do, you need to maintain this relationship. And that's why new forms of work are also emerging today. So if we recap, three points and three like paths for solution. New tech tools that we can develop, and I'm sure you already have a lot of ideas, and I would love to hear from them. 
Education and work are converging today, again, because as I said, it's been, it was already the case in the Middle Age, where you had a lot of cooperation on lots of different crafts. Um, and this, yeah, this collective are basically super, super important. And one more thing, because I'm really aware that we talked about like world challenges, and for now we've actually been focusing on work world challenges, as it's becoming global. And as I was mentioning, I now live in Berlin, which gave me a lot of opportunities to learn new words. So my favorite, for example, is Vorfreude, which means looking forward to something. Um, but another word that I found really interesting is Bildung. So in, in the German academics, like, academic system, you have the Erziehung, which will be you know, how to grow someone um, that knows things, basically. But you have, we also have the Bildung concept. So Bildung was also made very popular by Humboldt, who basically founded the modern, um, the modern German system for education and who also gave his name to the university in Berlin, for example. And the whole concept of a Bildung is giving a sense of responsibility. So it's also built in the time of the Enlightenment, in which you had these strong ideas for individual, but also world citizens. And because today, uh, so, and you then have this dimension of, you know, if you have well-informed humans that can be really good citizens, then it's going to be easier for them to retrain. So if I read, for example, this part of the quote, a person is always free to move from an occupation to another. When you have this sense of, you know, who am I, what do I want to do, and not only consider him or herself as someone moving on the job market. And I think it's really important to understand this, but to also go beyond, as we today have a huge and very grave um, topics that we need to, to solve collectively. Uh, and so Bildung goes really beyond that. So I'm talking about, for example, climate change. Thank you so much. The site will be on the website, margotpelen.com. And I'm also happy to get your idea feedback by email, margot.pelen at gmail.com. Thank you.